It has been argued that uh, all we need is more sanctions, and uh, there is an argument that sanctions have value, but it's the unwinding and the leverage of removing sanctions that actually accomplishes something, not adding more sanctions. In fact, Ms. Newland, when you went to Moscow in October of 2021, you were only allowed to go because there was a negotiation in advance of that where we agreed to take sanctions off of a Russian individual and Russia agreed in tandem to take sanctions off of you. I've had this discussion for quite a while. We have sanctions on 25 members of the Duma, mostly for political reasons, because they've politically spoken out against U.S. interests, but they are, of course, Russians. They also, in turn, sanction us as well. So 25, 30 members of Congress are sanctioned as well. Uh, do you favor or oppose some sort of arrangement similar to your arrangement where sanction removal was traded to enhance diplomacy? Do you favor that for legislative uh, sanctions? on individuals. Senator Paul, in the, in the context of a Russian decision to negotiate seriously and withdraw its forces from Ukraine and return territory, uh, I would certainly favor, and I believe Secretary Blinken would also favor, I don't think hard, I don't think context. hardly taking off sanctions on a member of the Duma is going to be traded for the end of the war. I mean, I wish it were that easy. What I'm talking about is allowing members of their Duma, many of whom may be favorable to our country, to travel to our country, and vice versa. I'm talking about diplomatic legislative exchange. I'm not talk, talking about trading it for peace. I'm sure that would be great, but I don't think that's really on the table. Trading, you know, removing sanctions on Senator Risch for peace. I, you know, I wish that were important enough, but I don't know that that's going to happen. But that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about very small, incremental removal of sanctions on legislative members in exchange for them doing the same. Uh, Senator, all of the members of the Duma on whom we have sanctions are people who have supported Russia's war, the annexation of Crimea, et cetera. That would uh, be about 90% of the people yeah, of Russia. I mean, I mean, it probably would be 90% of the Duma. We only have sanctions on 25 or 30, but I, I would venture to say every member of the Duma probably supports Crimea. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is their perspective. And if we are going to sanction people for their belief in, you know, their sort of nationalist version of the world, then we won't have any, we won't have any discussion between people or any legislative exchange. Senator, I would say that if it is in U.S. interest for there to be conversations with Russians, we should look hard at what can be done to facilitate those. I, I would, I would I'm, argue that it is. There's been a great deal of discussion about uh, prosecutions. Let's drag people to The Hague. Let's have some prosecutions. Uh, would Putin be one of those targets? Senator, he is uh, certainly guilty of prosecuting war crimes. He's certainly the leader of this illegal aggression. I, as I said, so it sounds like Senator the administration Cardin, would favor taking him to the Hague. As I said to Senator Cardin, we are now looking with our allies and partners and the Ukrainians at the appropriate judicial right. mechanism, and that would right. um, indicate the scope of but what if would you're, be covered. But if you're really thinking ultimately that there might be a peaceful settlement that doesn't involve unconditional surrender by the Russians or vice versa by the Ukrainians. Um, you might at least put some thought into the fact that saying that he's guilty of, of war crimes and that it's a possibility he's going to The Hague, that it may make uh, any kind of settlement, peaceful settlement, or someone who is fighting a war less likely to, to prosecute a peace or to engage in peace talks if he thinks, hmm, if there's peace, we're, we're going to The Hague, you know, that there's going to be prosecutions. I'm not saying one way or another on the facts of whether there are war crimes. I'm just saying that if you say the leader of somebody in a war that you'd like to ultimately resolve is guilty of these things, I think it makes it very much less likely. I think it's a careless remark, and it's a remark that doesn't uh, really think fully through the ramifications of what you say. Because when you say that, I think you're basically saying this war is going to go on forever. And if, if you want to picture devastation, you see Ukraine now, in five years, it'll be worse. I mean, I don't imagine this getting better over the next five years, but if you preclude peace, I think you inevitably will make it worse. Senator, if I may, uh, I've spent my life at the State Department. We never preclude peace. That's what we're about. I would cite the precedent of uh, Kosovo, of Bosnia, of Rwanda, where we have successfully 
supported wars winding down through diplomatic means while also pursuing We kind of, well, uh, just about unconditionally won, too, and we captured those people, or somebody captured them and gave them to us. So, I mean, that's what you would have to imagine. And I, I do think that you need to think through this, because I don't think you or the administration have, or anybody that's calling for prosecution of Putin uh, for war crimes and saying this is genocide and all of these things and saying it's the Holocaust. Because once you say that, I think you make uh, peace less likely. Nothing, nothing of what I'm saying is to say anything Putin has done is justified. I'm just saying that if you're going to say these things, you're very less likely to have any kind of peaceful settlement. Thank you. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our, our three witnesses. Thank you. Senator Paul. Mr. Chairman, it's estimated that between uh, 5 and uh, 18 million people died from COVID-19 worldwide. To a significant number of scientists, the evidence suggests that this originated from a lab leak in Wuhan. Does the State Department fund coronavirus research in China? Do we fund coronavirus? I don't believe so, but I don't know. I'll double check and we'll get back to you on that, Senator. The answer is yes, you do. And it's been going on for more than a decade. And it's done through a program called PREDICT and then the Global Virome. And why this is important is, we had a million Americans die, and we really haven't had any discussion of this. No hearings, nothing. People are unaware that they're even funding the research. We found out recently through the House unclassified report that money is going from the NIH to American universities to the, um, uh, uh, the Academy of Military Medical Sciences Research in China. We are subcontracting money and sending it over, but millions is coming from the State Department. So the idea is this, we will identify all the viruses in the world, we'll be safer because we identified them. But here's the question, are we safer to have some guy or some woman crawling down a cave 10 hours away from Wuhan, coming up with bat guano, coming up with viruses and bringing it to a city of 15 million like Wuhan? This is what's been going on for a decade. It's a setup for an accident, it's a setup for a mistake. And nobody's doing anything about it, we continue to fund it. The main group that's been getting this money is EcoHealth Alliance, over $100 million, a lot of it through the State Department. They continue to get money. They don't file the reports on time. They didn't stop their experiments, and yet we reward them with more money. 15 million people died, and we haven't done a thing about it. Nobody seems to care. We're not even sure we fund it. The State Department's a big funder of this project. It's a multi-decade-long project. But there are scientists, as we speak, from Stanford, from MIT, from prestigious universities around the country, these are not partisans. Most of them are not Republicans who stand up and say, oh my God, what are we doing? Bringing these viruses from remote bat caves to major metropolitan areas and with no controls over this. So we've been asking for information from the State Department because we want to know more about this. U.S. Right to Know has been sending FOIA request for two and a half years, and they don't get anything. So, Mr. Chairman, I've sent two letters. Some of them are six months old now, and we get a, you know, whatever. We're not going to give you any information. What I would hope for is that we could have, people always talk about bipartisanship. Could we not get bipartisan support for records? This is not partisan. We want to know what the U.S. State Department is funding. NIH resists our, our requests on their funds. The two things that we know for certain that have led us to believe this came from the lab that are big came because one was leaked, and this was a DARPA request. So the Chinese researchers in China wanted from DARPA money to create a virus that, guess what, looks exactly like COVID-19. They asked for it in 2018, we turned them down. Fortunately, we did the right thing for once, we turned them down. That doesn't mean they didn't do the research. And so many scientists at an aha moment, they saw this and they said, Oh my goodness, they asked for money to create something that looks almost exactly what we got. So in nature, you do not have coronaviruses that infect people that have what is called a furin cleavage site. Chinese said, give us money, we we're going to stick a furin cleavage site to allow it to infect humans more. We found out that not because you let us know, or not because the NIH let us know, they still resist. This is top secret, this is classified, this is a whole problem of classification, but it's also to cover up things. So we don't know anything about the 28 thing, but we had an illegal leak that went to somebody in the media that's now public that said the Chinese wanted to create a virus just like COVID-19 in 2018. The other thing we know is three researchers in the Wuhan lab, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, got very sick with flu-like symptoms similar to COVID in November. We only know that, though, because the Trump administration on the way out declassified it. So 
we have to get over all the classification. We also have to be more forthcoming. And I'm hoping the chairman will consider looking at our requests. These are not partisan. We want to know all the information about funding of research in China. We want to know the interactions. There were cables going back and forth between the State Department saying, holy cow, they're not wearing gloves. They don't wear masks in doing this research. They're doing it in what's called a BSL-2 as opposed to a BSL-4. Most of the research that we think escaped was not done in the appropriate lab. And the State Department knew about it, but we've had no hearings about this. They refused to give us information. 15 million people died, a million American died, and you won't give us information. So what I would ask is look at our request. This isn't partisan. This should be about discovering the origins of this. The scientific community is about 50-50 now, and I would hope that we, we suspect the Chinese of not being honest and withholding information, but it's sad that the U.S. government is withholding information from its representatives. Uh, I'll take back your request again, Senator. I would urge uh, a briefing perhaps in a skiff with the intelligence community on this, um, because as you know, uh, there is not a single view uh, about this particular set of issues, uh, but I understand your desire to understand what occurred. We're asking you for unclassified information that you hold, not the intel. I understand that. On September 12th and November 7th of last year, I sent letters to the State Department asking for records about coronavirus research that had been funded by the State Department. The State Department refused to comply. When Assistant Secretary Sherman came, I asked her the same question. She didn't seem to be aware that you had been funding coronavirus research, but you are. And I got the I'll get back to you line. A couple weeks later, I met personally with you at the State Department and asked you the same question. Will you not divulge to us the records of the State Department's support for coronavirus research, particularly in China? You assured me you would help. We communicated several times over the phone with another assistant secretary of state uh, who finally sent us a letter and said, no, we're not going to give you anything. So that's where we stand. And it's uh, my question is, what's the State Department hiding? Why won't you give these records to the American people? Uh, Senator, thank you. And uh, yes, I appreciated uh, uh, you raising this when we saw each other uh, a month or so ago. Uh, and my understanding is that our teams have been working to find an accommodation. Uh, there's longstanding. We've got a refusal, blanket refusal. No, they are not going to give us records. Um, we cannot directly provide uh, the sure you can. Unredact unredacted cables. We have a longstanding practice with this committee. Uh, about how we do you're things. Refusing, you're refusing to release them. No, but it's not I that you can't. There's a difference between can and may. You uh, won't do it, but you can do it. My hope is that we can find a, a way forward that answers your concerns so that you get the information that you're looking for. My understanding is that uh, our team's been working on that, and I uh, commit to continue to do that so we can get you the... the uh, We're talking about unclassified material. Most of this is unclassified. And so we just had a unanimous vote in the Senate and in the House and President Biden just signed a, a, a bill saying he's going to declassify stuff. But if you declassify it and you still hide it from the American people, that's a problem. I mean, we spend all of this time lambasting authoritarians and for lack of transparency. We have these silly networks on TV that are aligned with the Democrat Party saying democracy is under attack. What well, do you think transparency has something to do with democracy? You're refusing to give records on research. Money that went for research. We want to read the research grant proposals. We want to read what the people in Wuhan sent back to the State Department saying they did. Which viruses did they create? Because the thing is, is it sounds all great. We're going to identify all the viruses of the world. But part of what they do is they take a virus they found 200 feet down in a cave, and they mix it with another virus to create a virus that doesn't exist in nature, because they say that's how we're going to further identify it. There's a big debate that should be had whether that's safe, to take a virus from 100 feet down a bat cave 12 hours south of Wuhan and take it to a city of 10 million. And yet you won't help us investigate this. You refuse, and it makes... It is reminiscent of the countries we criticize for lack of transparency, and yet you sit there and say you're still going to continue to reviews. Um, Senator, I think there are very important uh, debates that certainly go beyond my knowledge and expertise, for example, on gain of function, um, that uh, I know there's a, a vigorous debate about whether the risk um, outweighs the reward. I don't have the expertise uh, but, you know that, uh, but how do we have oversight or investigate so, it if you won't give us a so record? We, so the uh, program that, uh, in this instance, USAID was involved in was not engaged in gain-of-function uh, work or gain-of-function. That's of a function. debate. 
But and, and that's your opinion. We'd like to see the records. So Fauci says there was no gain of function in Wuhan and nobody believes him anymore. You know, again, there's a there's a I think an important debate about this. Um, as I recall, during the uh, Obama administration, there's actually a moratorium put on. I know, but it isn't support. the debate. I don't want to have that debate with yeah. you. I only want to have. Again, the I believe that we can find a way to get you the information that you're looking All for. All right, but the last the last response we have from you is no. So the American public needs to know. I've asked many, many times. I've asked you in person. This is a second time in person. I've talked to two assistant secretaries of state, and the writing we get back from you is no. Not maybe. Not we'll work with you. It's no. So, so that's Senator, where we are now. No, uh, and it's not, it's not no, just to be clear. We did reach back out to your team just as recently as this week to offer to provide all of that information in briefing form, which is to say... Uh, which means you get to read it and interpret it and spin it, and we get to hear your spin. We don't want to hear no, your spin. We want to look at the dog. We're talking we're about not grant. In, we're not. In, we're not. We're in talking the about grant proposals. You ask as you act as if we're talking about the secrets of the Manhattan Project. We're talking about grant proposals, and we're talking about grant updates where someone has to write in and say, "Oh, we did this experiment, and this experiment, and we got this result." That's what we're talking about. Same thing from NIH. Same thing from HHS. Everybody's hiding it. And it's not even really something to protect the Biden administration. Most of this stuff happened in the previous administration. But I, I don't get it. Why circle the wagons? Maybe there's nothing to see here. But then it makes the whole world think you're hiding something if you won't give it to us. Yeah, so goes. just give it to us. It's a bunch of bureaucratic paper that we're looking to sift through to see if there are any clues. Because one of the biggest clues we have that they did this is they asked DARPA, and we only know this through a whistleblower, they asked DARPA for money to take a coronavirus and put a furin cleavage site in it to make it more infectious. And lo and behold, that's what COVID-19 is. It looks just like what they said they wanted to create with our money. And we turned them down, but that doesn't mean they didn't do the research. We're looking for research like that, that they were performing. We're looking for something that may be in their notes that hasn't been public, that hasn't been sifted through. But what we feel is that people at State Department and at NIH and HHS are conflicted. Why? Because if you funded research that somehow is linked to the pandemic or a leakage of that, that doesn't look so good for the people who lunded it. So we see this as a circling of the wagons and a conflict of interest that maybe there are people within the State Department who funded research who are worried that it might be linked to the pandemic. But we can't just accept your spin on it because people there may be self-interested, the people who funded the program. We're just asking to look at the data, but so far you're, you're, it has been no. We've had a few phone calls, but we don't want your spin on it. We want to look at the documents uh, we, ourselves. Uh, we're, we're not providing spin. As I said, I believe we can provide the information you're looking for. We have longstanding practices and procedures in terms of actually providing documents and cables with this committee uh, that uh, we're not prepared to change. But in terms of getting you the information you're right. looking for, and the only cables we have that are of value we got leaked to us, or actually they were declassified by the Trump administration, those cables said, and these were from some State Department yep. folks, and it was amazing, and I don't actually fault anybody for missing it. I'm sure there are thousands of cables, but in, 19, uh, in 2018 18. or 17, they were sending cables back saying, holy you know what, they're over here working without gloves in unsafe conditions in a BSL-2 that should be a BSL-4, not a very safe condition, and that's why some of our intelligence people have, have leaned towards this coming from a lab. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to help us? Why wouldn't everybody well, want to help us? I, 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 I've seen those cables. You're right, they've, uh, they've come out, and I think what they said, at least as I read them, was that there were concerns based on uh, State Department Right, Officials but we, but we only know those because someone had the gumption to declassify statement. them. And I'll end with this because I know my time's up. Mr. Chairman, it takes one signature. He'll give all this stuff to me tomorrow if you'll sign a document because he says he won't sign it unless the chairman of a committee does it. And he's hiding behind some ruse. There is no law saying this. He could do it if he wants, but he's hiding behind some opinion that his own administration makes the rules to say they won't give it to Congress. But if you'll help me, we can get the information tomorrow. Everything he's saying won't give me, he will give me tomorrow if you'll send a letter. I, uh, I appreciate the Senator's time has expired, but I appreciate uh, your uh, concern. I understand that my committee counsel has spoke to your counsel this past Monday, um, and uh, your counsel followed up with us today, and we are uh, in the pursuit of trying to see how uh, you can be accommodated, and I Thank look you. forward to making that happen. So You're recognized for your questions. The FBI and the Department of Energy have concluded that uh, the likely origin of COVID is from a lab in Wuhan. 
Uh, Jeffrey Sachs of the Lancet Commission studied this for nearly two years and came to the same conclusion. 18-month investigation from the HELP Committee also came to the conclusion that the likely origin of the virus is from a lab in Wuhan. What are the conclusions of the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security on, on the origins of the virus? Um, Ranking Member Paul, uh, we defer uh, to other departments and agencies whose remit is to investigate the origins of COVID-19. To my knowledge, that is not work that we has, have undertaken. So um, when all of the different agencies report to the Director of National Intelligence, are you one of those agencies? Like they say, there's 17 different people have an opinion, on, supposedly, on this. So the Department of Homeland Security has not made any opinion or given any opinion to the Director of National in Intelligence based on any research that you have done. Uh, Ranking Member Paul, to my knowledge, we have not undertaken uh, our work to um, investigate right. the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. What we have done in response to what you accurately captured are its tragic consequences is we set up vaccination centers all across the country. The, to, the um, National Biological Threat Characterization Center is under your purview. Uh, do they investigate or evaluate the manipulation of viruses, either through recombination or mutation or cellular passage, serial passage in lab? Do they look at the threat of dual use? Basically, people say, oh, we're doing research for vaccines, but what if this escapes into the world and you've created a virus that never existed before? Is that under the purview of the National Biological Threat Characterization Center? Um, uh, Ranking Member Paul, I, I do believe uh, that uh, that organization looks at how um, uh, biological um, elements uh, and other uh, elements can be weaponized uh, to uh, the detriment uh, of our security. You know, there's at least 12 different places in the United States where labs are getting this. To make it even you know, more concerning, though, we've been funding labs, not only the lab in Wuhan, we've actually funded military research in China. We now have evidence that NIH money goes to American universities who then subcontract it to the Academy of Military Medical Science Research, AMMS. It's finally now been listed as a category of where we're not supposed to export things, but for years now, nobody, somebody's asleep at the switch whether it's you or somebody else in government. We've got a big government. We've got all these different intel agencies. we got who's, who's watching? Because the thing is, is who in their right mind would think it is a good idea to send American tax dollars to a university, an American university, who then sends it to do military research? Now, even the stuff over there that's civilian research is only as good as we can trust them that that's really what it is. And there's much evidence that there's an intermingling of military and civilian and dual uh, purpose research over there. And so somebody's got to do something here. Somebody's got to step forward. And my suggestion to you is if you've got something called the National Biological Threat Characterization Center, that you'd look at the 12 universities in our country that are doing this kind of research. So basically they're taking a virus and that's known to infect humans and they're taking a portion of another virus they don't know anything about and saying, well, let's see what happens if we put a new protein on this other virus to see if it's more infectious or more lethal. And quite a few times when they do these experiments, gain of function research, the people within government say, oh, well, nothing to see here. It's not really gain of function. Then they play with the definitions. And yet a million people died from something like this. A million people died from a leakage of a virus. This isn't the first time. There are dozens or entire books written of leaks. There are probably 100 leaks from U.S. labs that have been documented in the last several years. And yet we have an agency that I think sometimes is talking about things that may not be quite as pressing as a million people dying in the homeland. So, you know, my suggestion is, is that we maybe should take some of our resources. I think you asked for $17 million for this uh, biological threat characterization center. You know, maybe some of that ought to be used in evaluating some of the dual science and dual purpose research that's going on within the U.S. Um, we would like to get information, and just last week, uh, Senator Johnson and I sent a letter two weeks ago asking for any information you have on the origins of this. We passed unanimously, which is something, unanimously in the Senate and the House uh, to, to declassify this information. But our problem isn't even that. 
a lot, most of this stuff is declassified, and we get refusals from everybody in the Biden administration. We've been stonewalled for the last two years, and we get nothing. We not only have get nothing, we have FOIA'd things that they, a, a federal co a judge requires them to release, and we have uh, talk back and forth, chatter on email from people at DITRA saying, well, we're not going to give it to him because one person signing this, and it looks like he signed it individually, so we're just not going to give it to him. And then we have other people saying in the same email chain, that doesn't look good. If that gets FOIA'd, let's change the language because that doesn't look good. This is our government. We complain about the Chinese not giving us stuff. What I would like today is the assurance that you're going to give us any information we ask related to the origins of COVID. You say there hasn't been much, and maybe there hasn't been, but we would like to get responses to these things instead of responses that say, you know, take a leap. You know, this was the elected government. We were hoping to get help from the other side, but so far we haven't gotten any help from the other side on trying to get these records. But we would hope you would do it just because you are, you care about a million people dying. So that's my request is that uh, you at least will respond to our request asking for more information about the origins of COVID. Uh, Ranking member uh, Paul, I have a number of things to say. Number one, um, I share your concern with respect to the threat that the People's Republic of China uh, presents to the homeland, number one. Number two, to my knowledge, uh, DHS has not done, does not have ongoing work, and has no future plan to do work on assessing the dangers uh, that may be associated with gain-of-function of research. My, my understanding is that no work has been done, no work is planned, and no work is underway. Um, third, um, I believe that you have sent to the department a letter requesting information in uh, just a couple of weeks ago, within the last two weeks, and it is our intention uh, to respond appropriately uh, to your letter. And then, uh, I'm happy to recognize them at this time. Will you be testifying, Ms. Powers, to uh, Homeland Security over your budget as you've done today to USAID? Uh, no. You mentioned that the records that I've requested from the PREDICT program that is part of USAID concerning coronavirus research that you gave them to the Committee of Jurisdiction, if you're not testifying before Homeland Security and you're sitting here today before the Foreign Relations Committee, I would wonder why the Foreign Relations Committee wouldn't be the Committee of Jurisdiction. Thank you. Senator Kane made a similar point, and so uh, let me just, I guess, clarify, but USAID has provided hundreds of documents to, to, both, to both SFRC and, uh, and the Homeland Security Government so Affairs you're Committee. saying that all the documents that I want from the PREDICT program you've already given to Senator Menendez? I can't, I know you're asking for a range of things. There are some that we're not. Senator Menendez, are you aware of having documents on the coronavirus research that I'm interested in? Uh, well, I'm happy to let you ask questions of the witness. Uh, I don't intend to be put under. Uh, no, I don't mean process. to be critical. I just I'm, don't no, think I'm, you I'm going to respond I mean, to you uh, in my own yeah, time. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think he does because I've been requesting this. And, you know, if his staff does have all this information, you'd think somebody would be forthcoming with saying, oh, we've already got all this. I don't think what you're saying is, is honest. And so my question is, you say you've given it to Senate Foreign Relations, and you say you've also given it to Homeland Security. To whom, with those committees, have you given this information? I, I have not personally handed over Somebody the information it. myself, they give it, but we will absolutely get to back to your staff I need to, to ask ascertain them. Did you give that exactly to the chairman the documents of this committee? Are? Did you give it to the chairman of Homeland Security? You don't know if the correspondence was with the chairman or if it was with someone else. I would presume it would have to be through the chairman. What, what I know is that we have provided hundreds of documents okay, but to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. About, I apologize for not saying that earlier. My, my question is not just about committee. hundreds of documents. My question is about coronavirus research that USAID has funded. Oh, sorry. In yes, China. I mean on the Predict program specifically. On the Predict I don't mean program, on the, on the Predict the program, but specifically yeah. on coronavirus research, either granted or denied. Some of the most important information we have is actually a DARPA grant where Wuhan Institute of Virology asked for money to create a virus that looks like what COVID became. We didn't fund it, but it shows that they were already interested in creating a virus similar to what COVID-19 is. So we want to know, did the PREDICT program give grant proposals for the creation of viruses that were similar to COVID-19 or, or that might have become COVID-19? And we also want to know if... Um, 
you know, you denied any of these programs. It's important to us to know if they were asking for other money from you to do research that could have become COVID-19. But what I've gotten from you is not an answer. You're saying, oh, somebody else has all this information. And we'll pursue it, but then you'll be gone. And then in six months time, we'll come back and say, well, we asked the chairman of this committee and that committee. They don't have it. The thing is, is it makes us all suspicious you won't give it to me. Or you're going to give it to somebody else. You're going to give it to a Democrat chairman, but not to someone from the minority party. So this is all very unfortunate. And it, it, it makes us concerned about the transparency of your administration. Senator Paul, if I may. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not the question of Senator Paul. Ms. Powers, uh, did USAID fund coronavirus research in Wuhan, China? We did not fund gain-of-function research, as you know. That's not the question. You know. The question is, did you fund coronavirus research in Wuhan, China? Before my time, there was the PREDICT program with which you're familiar, which ended in China in 2019. Yeah, this is a $200 million program, and the GAO has also identified that some of these grants went directly to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where there is a suspicion that the lab leak began that began the pandemic. Um, has USAID awarded funds to the Academy of Military Medical Sciences in China? I, not to my knowledge, but I'd have to give I think the answer is once again yes. GAO has found that there have been subawards of NIH money as probably as well as USAID money that went to the Academy of not just medical research, military medical research in China. Now, part of the unknowns here is we can't get the records to look at this. So I've been asking for months and months for records. In September of last year, I wrote Ms. Powers, the USAID, a request asking for records from the PREDICT program. These are not classified. These are simply records of scientific research, and we want to read the grants to find out what they were doing and whether the research was dangerous or not. Um, the response I got from your agency was, USAID will not be providing any documents at this time. They're just unwilling to give documents on scientific grant proposal. We're paying for it. They're asking for $745 million more in money, and we get no response. So two weeks ago, the ranking member, uh, Rish, myself, and 25 other Republican senators, unfortunately, so far, signed a letter once again. They've, it's still no response. We're not asking for classified information. We're not asking for anything unusual. Um, 20 million people died around the world. You're supposed to be an agency that cares about the death of people around the world. We, you know, talk about starvation and famine, and 20 million people died from a virus, and you won't give us the basic information about what grants you're funding around the world and who you're funding. Should we be funding the Academy of Military Medical Research in China? They're now off limits. But did we fund them? And who was making the decision? You know who ran the PREDICT program? UC Davis. Have you had any conversations with UC Davis about research in China and whether it was advisable? So again, to set the record straight, first of all, the PREDICT program ended in 2019. Um, we have people... And yet it goes on in other forums and other names. That, that's certainly well, not USAID program. Well, you have, go, you have a program forward. called Emergency Pandemic Threats Program still, don't you? If I could just, just finish in response to the first set of allegations, um, we have provided hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents related to the PREDICT program for the very reason that you say, because we are in- Not to us. We are, again, as I know you had an exchange with Secretary Blinken as well, consistent with longstanding practice. Not going to give them to us. responsive to the committees of jurisdiction. Not going to, you've been consistent in not giving us any That's information. That's not true. But what we, you're we've saying provided is hundreds of pages in response to, to the current ranking to, to the Senate, Homeland Security, and Government Affairs Committee. For example, we've had extensive. We've been requesting this and gotten none committee. of it. I'm on that committee as well. The thing is, is what we get from you and from the State Department at large is that if Senator Menendez signs it, you'll give us documents. Until then, you'll give us nothing. And we have got nothing, zero. You said, we'll not be providing any documents. I now have 25 senators have sent you a letter, and you aren't responding. Well, and we, we don't, we want, we want to see the scientific grants. We give you the money, the taxpayers well, give you the money. We deserve to know where the money went, whether it happened. Look, you're right, it, ha it ended in 2019. When did the virus come about? In about 2019. Some of the research proposals that came about in 2018 were Wuhan Institute of Virology asking for money 
to create a virus with a furin cleavage site in it, a coronavirus, a SARS-like virus with a furin cleavage site. That's exactly what COVID turned out to be. They wanted money to create such a virus. So we want to know, are there other research proposals that you either granted or denied that were on the same veins of creating viruses that could have become COVID-19? We can't tell because you won't give us the information. Again, we, we consistent with longstanding practice. We are providing extensive documentation. We have a whole That's team just of people not who do true. nothing other That's than look just back not and true. predict. That is not it true. It is factually accurate. That is it not is. true. Everything we have asked, we have not gotten. I have not seen one document on the PREDICT program. I understand that, again, consistent with common practice Consistent that you're not going to give it to any senators. No, no, no. We're that. providing... Uh, all of the kinds of documentation that you're <laughs> you describing. You are not. You're we being are. dishonest. We, you're being no, dishonest. I'm not. I'm we haven't gotten not. one scrap of paper from you. There, not there, one again, scrap of paper. With the committees of jurisdiction, we are providing all of the paperwork that you are not. requested by the I'm chair on the other committee. I'm the ranking member on well, the other committee, and I haven't seen a scrap of paper from that committee either. Well, that is. I, that, See, here's what I, the I American people think. Actually, I can't tell you what the happens American at the The American people think this that because you won't respond, and because you respond with a non-response, that you have something to hide. I don't know if you have anything to hide or not. I want to see every grant proposal that had to do with coronaviruses that went to China from the U.S. government, from all facets of the U.S. government, and every bit of the Biden administration is stonewalling us and will not give us the information. It makes us think and makes us suspicious that you're hiding something. And it wasn't even you. This was the previous administration. We go back two or three administrations. We just want to see the information, and yet you sit there and you say we will do something, we are doing something, which is absolutely the opposite of the truth. You are not being honest. Is the FBI still meeting with social media companies? Uh, we're having some interaction with social media companies, but, uh, but all of those interactions have changed fundamentally uh, in the wake of the court's rulings. That's sort of an acknowledgement that perhaps you weren't just talking about national security, child pornography, and human trafficking, right? You had other areas of, of discussion that did involve constitutionally protected speech. No, no, that's not an acknowledgement of but that. But then how did you change your behavior? Uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, in, in order to make sure that we don't run afoul of any court ruling, I would say, by the way, of course, that the injunction has been stayed uh, by the Supreme Court. Did, did any, uh, anybody from the FBI ever discuss constitutionally protected speech with social media organizations? Not to my understanding. Vaccine efficacy, never discussed any post concerning vaccine efficacy? Well, uh, certainly not, because to my understanding, uh, as, as you know, the, the FBI was the first and for a long time the only agency in the intelligence community to assess that the COVID origin was most likely from a lab leak. Uh, so the idea you, that I, we I, were I engaging you, I in... I commend you for yeah. that, but the Twitter files and other indications, as well as the Missouri versus Biden, list many cases of both DHS and FBI discussing constitutionally protected speech, vaccine efficacy, mask e efficacy, um, people who said, my brother got the vaccine and died yesterday. And the brother actually did die, but proof of cause and effect is one thing. But taking down posts like that was part of the discussion in these meetings. Not by the FBI. We, we would not have been engaging with social media companies about vaccine efficacy, to my knowledge, certainly. Director Ray, in 2017, the Department of Justice issued subpoenas to members of uh, the House Intelligence Committee, congressional staffers, as well as uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee staffers uh, to turn over private information. Were you involved with that investigation, aware of it at the time? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that specific investigation. This had to do with the leaks, I believe. We have never been told completely, but the leaks concerning the uh, uh, Crossfire Hurricane and the leaks concerning the conversation between Flynn and Kislyak that was wiretapped that was classified that somehow got out, but you're not aware of anybody from uh, Congress being investigated? Well, as I sit here right now, that's not something that's ringing a bell for me. Okay. Do you see a problem with the Department of Justice uh, issuing subpoenas to congressional staffers who are providing oversight to the very organization that's issuing the subpoenas? Well, certainly anytime uh, there's an investigative activity that touches upon a, a separate branch of government, namely the legislative branch, it has to be done extraordinarily carefully. And there are all kinds of policies that the department has in place to make sure that that's done appropriately. 
Director A, did the FBI, FBI pay Twitter money to moderate uh, content moderation? I'm not aware of us paying money to moderate content there or anywhere what else. The, what was the $3 million for that the FBI gave that's been revealed in Twitter files, which has been characterized by those writing the Twitter files as payment for content moderation? Basically, they said Twitter, you know, you guys were meeting with them all the time, and you had them taking down so many posts, they said, well, gosh, it's a lot of work. Why don't you pay us? And so you did. You paid them $3 million. Are you aware of the payment? I, I'm not aware of that specific payment, but I can tell you that when it comes to payments, uh, going back well over four decades, when we are required by federal law, when a company, like in this instance a provider, uh, goes through expenses to produce information, uh, we're required to reimburse them for those expenses. And so I think that a lot of the questions about payments revolve around exactly that. And you will repeat under oath that there was never any discussion of the FBI uh, to take down constitutionally protected speech. You think it's all national security, child pornography, sex trafficking, no discussion of constitutionally protected speech because this is all going to come out and a lot of it's come out already in depositions, but you're saying there was never any discussion by any of your agents in any of these meetings of constitutionally protected speech being taken down. To my knowledge, our agents conducted themselves in compliance with the law throughout. Same question to Secretary Mayorkas. You're uh, not aware of your agents ever discussing any constitutionally protected speech with any of the social media companies? The same answer as Director Ray provided to you, Ranking Member Paul. Thank you, Ranking uh, The Church Committee issued its final report revealing decades of widespread abuse by federal intelligence agencies against U.S. citizens. The Bipartisan Church Committee outlined countless examples of how the federal government used powers that were meant to counter foreign threats against its own citizens. In an effort to protect society, these abuses happened under presidents of both parties. Domestic groups like the NAACP and the Women's Liberation Group engaged in nonviolent, lawful political expression were targeted and surveilled for contradicting the approved government initiative and narrative. Intelligence agencies used their powers to serve ideological purposes, attempting to covertly influence social policy and political action. The government distorted and exaggerated facts, leveraged mass media, and attacked the leadership of groups it considered to be threats to the social order. One of these so-called threats to social order was Martin Luther King Jr. The purpose of the church committee's years-long investigation was to expose the intelligence agency's unlawful overreach into the private lives of Americans. The committee hoped that its findings would result in more transparency and accountability to ensure that these abuses never occurred again. They say history repeats itself, doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Unfortunately, as we sit here today, I fear that our federal government is still undertaking many of the same tactics that the Church Committee found to be unworthy of democracy and occasionally reminiscent of totalitarian regimes. Federal agencies, including the FBI and the DHS, continue to operate in a manner that is outside the scope of their authorities, wasting taxpayer dollars and infringing on the rights of Americans. Earlier this month, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals found that the federal agencies, including the FBI and DHS, likely violated the First Amendment. In fact, the judge said it was one of the worst, if not the worst, violation of the First Amendment in the history, in, our, in American history. By coercing social media companies to remove speech the government disagreed with related to the origins of COVID-19, pandemic lockdowns, vaccine efficacy, and the Hunter Biden laptop stories. FBI and DHS regularly met with social media companies and pressured them to remove content it deemed as misinformation, including posts and accounts that originated from within the United States and including posts and accounts that are verifiably true. And the censorship of the Constitution, a constitutionally protected speech on social media is just one example of the executive branch actions in recent years weaponizing the federal government against its people. The FBI continues to misuse its authority under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. You would think we'd be going after foreigners, but we are using the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to go after Americans. 
as we observed and was done with individuals participating in the George Floyd protests. Un unconstitutional access to the Americans activities was instituted against those in the George Floyd protests. DHS warned of violence from Americans who questioned the efficacy and safety of the COVID-19 vaccines and protested government overreach associated with pandemic mitigation measures. These agencies charged with protecting the security of our nation targeted parents who protested restrictive COVID-19 policies at school board meetings and labeled Catholics as potential domestic terrorists. It is hardly a surprise that the faith of Americans in their government is dwindling. Instead of focusing on rampant violent crime across the nation and the unprecedented crisis at the border, FBI and DHS are using their resources to surveil and censor law-abiding Americans engaged in constitutionally protected speech. When the federal government's activities are improperly focused inward, legitimate national security threats go unnoticed. The Church Committee highlighted the important point highlighting that the FBI placed more emphasis on domestic dissent than on organized crime. And its effort to combat foreign spies suffered because of its focus on American protest groups. The narratives from the past and the present draw a concerning parallel. The lessons of the Church Committee report resonate nearly 50 years later, yet the cycle of executive branch overreach continues. The American people deserve accountability from the federal government and Congress cannot continue to abdicate its constitutional duty to conduct oversight. As the Church Committee aptly pointed out, power must be checked and balanced, and the preservation of liberty requires the restraint of laws. It is our responsibility to ensure that the principles of American democracy endure, and I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will work with me to do just that. Secretary Mayorkas, is uh, DHS still meeting with social media companies to discuss content moderation? Um, Ranking Member uh, uh, Paul, you and I have discussed uh, this before. Uh, we do not um, uh, meet with social media companies for the purpose of instructing them to take down content. You have never had any meetings with the social media companies to discuss content moderation? What we have done in the past, Ranking Member Paul, as I shared with you previously, is we, along with other federal agencies, have met with social media companies in a public-private partnership to speak of the threats to the homeland so that those companies are alert to them. Do you, we think, do a not threat, do you think a threat to the homeland is a discussion of vaccine efficacy? I, I do not. Uh, a ranking member, Paul, and if I you say, if you'll uh, have your staff read, and I think it'd be good for you to read also the Missouri versus Biden case. It lists time and time again discussion of constitutionally protected speech that has nothing to do with national security. So when you say you didn't meet to do with that, yes, you were meeting. You just disagree with the characterization of it. Were you meeting with social media companies to discuss content moderation? And your answer to that is no. Um, what I, my answer. That, that's the I, specific question. Did you meet with them and were you meeting with them to discuss content on the internet? My answer remains the same, Ranking Member Paul, that we met on a periodic basis with other federal agencies and a group of social media companies to speak with them about the threat environment that the homeland faced. Right, and this includes discussion of vaccine efficacy, mask efficacy, Hunter Biden's laptop. Are these meetings still occurring? Um, uh, Ranking Member Paul, they are not. We, we do not participate in any such And meeting. the reason the meetings aren't occurring is because a federal judge placed an injunction on you and the Biden administration acknowledged that they're not having the meetings. So you need at least acknowledge that the court is talking to you about this and saying what you were doing was violating the First Amendment. Secretary Mayorkas, is uh, DHS still meeting with social media companies to discuss content moderation? Um, Ranking Member uh, uh, Paul, you and I have discussed uh, this before. Uh, we do not um, uh, meet with social media companies for the purpose of instructing them to take down content. You have never had any meetings with the social media companies to discuss content moderation? What we have done in the past, Ranking Member Paul, 
as I shared with you previously, is we, along with other federal agencies, have met with social media companies in a public-private partnership to speak of the threats to the homeland so that those companies are alert to them. Do you, we think, do a not to, do you think a threat to the homeland is a discussion of vaccine efficacy? I, I do not, uh, a Ranking Member Paul. And if, I you, say, if you'll uh, have your staff read, and I think it would be good for you to read also the Missouri versus Biden case, it lists time and time again discussion of constitutionally protected speech that has nothing to do with national security. So when you say you didn't meet to do with that, yes, you were meeting, you just disagree with the characterization of it. Were you meeting with social media companies to discuss content moderation? And your answer to that is no. Um, what I, my answer that, is That's the I, specific question. Did you meet with them and were you meeting with them to discuss content on the internet? My answer remains the same, Ranking Member Paul, that we met on a periodic basis with other federal agencies and a group of social media companies to speak with them about the threat environment that the right. homeland faced. Right, and this includes discussion of vaccine efficacy, mask efficacy, Hunter Biden's laptop. Are these meetings still occurring? Um, uh, Ranking Member Paul, they are not. We, we do not participate in any such And meeting. the reason the meetings aren't occurring is because a federal judge placed an injunction on you and the Biden administration acknowledged that they're not having the meetings. So you at least acknowledge that the court is talking to you about this and saying what you were doing was violating the First Amendment. Director Ray, as you mentioned earlier, the FBI has concluded with moderate confidence that the virus leaked from the lab in Wuhan. The intriguing thing is that if I were to say that, as I did, and others said this for over a year and a half, Facebook actually suppressed that knowledge, suppressed its spread and its ability to be transferred from their users. Um, whether or not they did that at the behest of the FBI or the DHS is eventually going to come out in the court case, but uh, it is a big deal. I've met with the FBI, and one of the things I'm interested in is trying to get people on both sides of the aisle to be interested in the possibility that what happened in Wuhan could happen in the United States, it could happen in 20 different labs around the world, it could happen with nefarious actors. It's something we should be concerned with, the idea of making and creating viruses that are more dangerous than occur in nature. One thing that would help us would be to reveal more to us of your conclusions. So, for example, for the longest time, I'm pretty sure it was classified that you had even concluded that. I think your public statements were the first time we ever under, were heard publicly that the FBI had actually made a conclusion. So even the conclusion was secret for a long time. Now, you had to have an analysis. You must have a paper sort of description of your thought process. Um, we passed unanimously legislation to declassify all this stuff. Most of the stuff doesn't need to be classified. A lot of those conclusions are uh, just basically we've been had them out in the public and we've been discussing this. But it would help the debate and maybe help us prevent something like this from happening again if you'd release your report. Are you going to declassify and release your report that allows you to conclude with moderate confidence that the virus came from the lab? Well, I, I know my staff has been engaged uh, with you directly on this, including the, the head of our WMD directorate, uh, and I expect that to continue. I know you've asked for a number of documents that I believe we're getting ready to provide to you potentially as early as this week. Uh, as to what can be shared publicly as opposed to shared with you in your oversight capacity, that gets a little more complicated because sometimes the information is interwoven with other agencies' information we don't we entirely don't control. That. We don't want to know who your sources are. We want to hear your conclusions. We want to have what your scientists have looked at. And one of the specific things we asked them, they said they would be forthcoming with, and the meeting seemed to include cooperation, but then they just go dark on us. So, for example, one of the most important information from my point of view that suggests this came from Wuhan is that in 2018, the lab in Wuhan, along with a scientist at University of North Carolina, as long as Pe along with Peter Dayzak, applied for money from DARPA. They wanted to create a coronavirus that had a cleavage site in it that's more commonly found in human viruses. They were denied the money, but that led us to thinking, and a lot of people thinking, wow, they were already asking for money to do, to create a virus that has the same structure as COVID had. There apparently are other grants, and I've been trying to get the grants from government for three years. The, the most secretive organization in our government with regard to COVID is HHS and NIH. 
We pay for all their grants. None of their stuff's classified, and they won't give us the stuff. But I think in your review, my guess is your people knew where to look, and I asked them, are there other grants like the Diffuse grant from DARPA that was denied that you can point us to, four or five other grants, so either given to them in Wuhan, denied to them in Wuhan, maybe given to another country somewhere around the world, but worried us that and were circumstantial evidence leading us to the conclusion. Those things should be easy. They're non-classified. We can't get them from the NIH. If you've seen them, we just want you to help us because it needs to be public because our concern is this could happen again. There are scientists, legitimate, pedigreed virologists at major universities who believe not only that this came from this lab, but the next one could kill 5 to 50 percent. What if they're aerosolizing Ebola virus or Marburg virus or Nipah virus? This is as dangerous as nuclear weapons, but we've had only one side sort of interested in this so far. But if more information were revealed, maybe we can get both sides of the aisle interested and eventually do something to try to prevent this from happening again. And so if you will help urge them to give us some of the information and really figure out how to declassify stuff. I know most of intelligence is classifying and keeping secrets, but there's important public policy decisions that come from making it public. And do it in a smart way where you don't reveal things that you don't want to reveal, but I'm guessing 99% of the report probably already includes no classified information. Well, uh, we look forward to working with you on this. Um, I'm very proud of the work our folks did here. Uh, it was rigorous, it was thorough, and for an awful long time, we were the only agency all by our lonesome uh, reaching that assessment. Um, and. We will look forward to working with you as best we can. I will say there we continue to investigate, so there may be some issues that get wrapped up in that, but, but I, I know that our folks have found the engagement with your office to be right. productive, and we look forward to continuing One that. One really quick point for those who doubt that this came from the lab. The FBI has concluded with moderate confidence. The Department of Energy, which has a lot of scientists, probably more scientists than any other part of our government, has concluded with low confidence. And the Lancet Commission, and the minority report from this, Bob Cadillac's report from this committee, a number of groups that spent a long time have come to the conclusion, not for partisan reasons, because we worry that this is going to happen again or could happen again. So I think we should try to all work together to see what we can do to, to restrain and restrict this type of dangerous research. Thank you. Under Paul. I think it's easy to look around the world and find places where the U.S. taxpayer can be asked to send money to fix the world's problems, but there is an important question we might want to ask before we start sending $100 billion more. Where are you going to get it? You know, we don't have any money. Every bit of our tax revenue goes to Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and food stamps. Those four programs consume all of our tax revenue. Everything else is borrowed. In fact, the entire discretionary budget right now is being borrowed. We borrowed a trillion dollars in the last three months. Interest rates are, have doubled. Interest payments have doubled. So you can have all this goodwill and try to fix the world's problems, but you're ignoring the rot and ruin you're creating in your own country. Mr. O'Brien, in Russia's weakened state, it's tempting to forget that they are a nuclear power. But I think our foreign policy decisions need to take into account the dangers of war escalating in Ukraine. As Harvard's Graham Allison points out, if Putin is forced to choose between humiliating defeat on the one hand and escalating the level of destruction, there's every reason to believe he chooses the latter. There's a great deal of evidence that the war in Ukraine has come to a stalemate. Even Ukraine's commander-in-chief of the armed services has admitted as much. In Graham Allison's view, the Ukraine war has escalated far enough to see how bad things would become if we end up in a world where nuclear weapons are used. Allison believes that where we are now, both for Putin's Russia and for the Biden-led U.S. and the Western alliance, it's time to search for an off-ramp for all the parties. What is being done at the State Department to search for an off-ramp? Thank you, Senator. I, a few points. I mean, I can speak to the foreign policy implications. My belief is if we don't stand with Ukraine now, we'll be spending much more on defense in the future. Um, and much of this supplemental goes to reinvest in the United States. So far from rot and ruin, 
we're actually shoring up the foundations in our energy sector, as Assistant Secretary Pyatt. So your argument is that war and funding war around the world is good for our armaments industry? Yeah. I'm saying this supplemental is good for our economy. For the, for the armaments industry. I, I, so it, really, it's a justification of war. To me, that's sort of reprehensible, the idea that, and this is coming from my side as well, oh, glory be, the war is really not that bad. Broken windows are not that bad because we pay people to fix them. Broken countries are not so bad because, hey, look, the armaments industry is going to get billions of dollars out of this. Yeah. I think that's a terrible argument. I wish y'all would say maybe there's a, you know, go back to your freedom argument or something. But the idea that you're going to enrich the armaments manufacturers, I think, is reprehensible. Well, Senator, I'm not making the argument war is good. I'm making the argument in this case war is necessary. And that we can make a little profit on the side. It's not so bad since the armaments guys will make a lot of profit on this, right? No, Senator, I think you're proposing a kind of false choice that I either have to say that or say nothing. What I'm saying is that our economy rests on a foundation of innovation, and in this supplemental, we're investing in our energy sector, as but you just since heard the money's of borrowed, we're borrowing the money. We don't have it. We don't have a pot of money. So what you're arguing is, in essence, that we borrow the money from China, we send it to Ukraine, Ukraine sends it back to buy arms from us, and that's a win-win. How do we win when we're borrowing money to pay people? See, this is this sort of false sort of argument that, oh, well, look, we'll create five jobs for every dollar we spend, but we're borrowing the money. It doesn't make any sense. It's coming from somewhere where it would be in a productive use to where it's into the uh, use of uh, basically fomenting a war and continuing a war. No, that's not the choice in front of us, Senator, and I'm sorry that you feel you know, that that's the way you want to frame it. The choice in front of us is do we invest in the capacities that allow this war to be won? Those include capacities in energy, in defense, in IT. In, they the, include in, the, in the original question, let's get away from funding the armaments people. Uh, you know, I'm not for that. But the original question is, what are you doing to develop an off-ramp? You know, when I listen to your presentations, it sounds like the Department of War. I don't hear the Department of Diplomacy in front of me. Where are the diplomats? Is anybody talking about negotiation? Yeah. Do, you do you really believe that Russia, uh, that Ukraine's going to push Russia out of, uh, out of Ukraine? They're going to push them out of Crimea, push them out of the East, and that Zelensky's position, we will not negotiate till they're gone from Ukraine, is viable? and that there's not going to have to be some negotiation beforehand. beforehand. All if wars. You but if you believe that, though, the meat grinder continues, and Ukraine will be an utter destruction, and tens of thousands of more people will die if there is no negotiation. You would think that as a superpower, we would be involved somewhat with encouraging negotiation, but I've heard nothing from you and nothing from anyone in your administration, frankly, that talks about negotiating. So, well, Senator, then uh, I hope you would you know, sit down and talk with me about what we're doing in this regard. Here, I'll give you a little sense of it. All wars end with a negotiation. We've made clear we'll do that with Ukraine, not over Ukraine's head. It takes two parties to negotiate the end of a war. President Putin is not serious about negotiating the end of the war. He has said he wants to wait and see what happens in November 24. So we're preparing for that eventuality so we can have a negotiation that will actually stick as opposed to the track record of broken agreements that President Putin has made with a whole range of his neighbors up until now. So that's successful there, diplomacy, there, not Senator mere Markley. diplomacy. There are actually some who say we're back to about where we started as far as negotiating and tens of thousands of people have died on both sides and we haven't been successful. But I still hear only war, and I don't hear diplomacy. No, but I think what we're looking at is successful diplomacy. I just spent last weekend with 66 countries talking about the basis of a successful peace in, in Ukraine. Russia didn't show up. That, again, is the problem. You don't have a willing partner on the other side. So simply saying that there must be talks is you're asking for a monologue, not, not, a, not diplomacy. Senator Merkley. Secretary O'Brien. No, Senator. Senator Merkley. Secretary O'Brien, 